Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers, now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education.indiana.edu. Smithville Fiber, the Gigacity Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. The number of working teens has dropped by more than 20% since the 1970s. And you need to pick things that are important to you and things that will help you in the long run. And for me, that was sports and school. Ahead, the complicated balancing act as kids try to best position themselves for college and their future careers. Up next, we take a look at food insecurity and seniors. Uh, there's things you'd like to experience and things you'd like to eat and this and the other that you don't do anymore or can't do anymore. Why seniors are the fastest growing group of people suffering from hunger. And we talk with an expert about whether the mass shootings in Las Vegas call for any movement on gun reform. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The number of teens working a part-time job has significantly decreased since the late 1970s. Education experts say a part-time job can give students a competitive edge when it comes to college admissions, but they're also expected to volunteer, participate in clubs, all while keeping their grades up. My colleague, Lindsay, Lindsay Wright, joins us now with more, Lindsay. Thanks, Joe, and that's right. Students in high school are often involved in so many activities that it makes adequately focusing on school and college admissions difficult. Data shows that working a part-time job while in school can actually be an advantage for some students, but it's a balancing act. There's no wasted space in Nicole Clee's locker. This is my AP Chem binder. Um, it doesn't fully fit in it. <laughs> it doesn't fully fix, it's too big. <laughs> Clee is a junior at Franklin Central. She has a full schedule. She's a soccer player, participates in student council, and takes several advanced classes. I keep my chemistry notes in the back. The course load is trying at times, but it pays off. The 16-year-old is ranked 38th out of more than 700 in her class. But Clee recently wanted to add another thing to her plate, a part-time job. I think there's a lot of people who feel pressured to get jobs so that they can pay for a car and to go out and do things. Her parents offer her money, but for Clee, it's about independence. Ultimately, though, it just wasn't doable. When Clee really looked at it, there simply weren't enough hours in the day. You don't have time for all of that, and you need to pick things that are important to you and things that will help you in the long run. And For me, that was sports and school. The challenge is clear. Clee is just too busy. Although some students don't have an option and need an income or to save for college, studies show Clee isn't alone. 75% of teens were working jobs in the 1970s. That dropped to around 55% in 2014. Tim Siegert, the director of counseling, says students are busier than ever and preparing for the next level is getting more rigorous. And because those, those uh, admission standards are getting more stringent, uh, parents are even saying, we want you focused more on taking a heavier course load, focusing more on extracurricular activities too, whether it be a sport, band, uh, volunteer service. Siegert says there are clear pros and cons to teens working part-time jobs. Colleges are looking for well-rounded students, and working a part-time job shows good time management and discipline. In turn, a student's academics can suffer. But data shows college undergrads who work 20 hours or less are more likely to have a higher GPA. If you work, you know, closer over 20 hours, then it is a challenge. Uh, less than 20 hours, it may be an advantage. The key is balance. 
And officials say there are other ways besides working to acquire the skills college admissions are looking for. What you need to do is find a way to distinguish your academic career by other supplemental experiences that say who you are and what you're committed to doing and what kind of a student or what kind of an employee you would be. This right here is our game field. Clee's mom, Shane Long, logs a lot of time on the soccer fields watching her daughter play. She says her daughter regularly spends up to 12 hours a day at school, sometimes more. And she learns respect. She learns um, multitasking. She learns all of those things in school and on the soccer field. Higher education officials say instead of working a job, high schoolers can try to align their activities with what they want to do in the future. The problem, though, it's rare that a high schooler knows that answer. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. School officials say that over time they've noticed parents have been more involved in the decision of whether or not their child should get a part-time job. Many push focusing on schoolwork, which could play a role in the lower number of teens getting jobs. But Joe, there are so many factors that play into this topic, there's really no right or wrong answer. Every mm -hmm. student's situation is different. All right, thank you very much, Lindsay. You're welcome. And now for headlines, we go over to Barbara Brozier, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. Vigo County could go back to the drawing board as officials debate a proposal to build a new jail. The county is considering a $63 million proposal for the new facility, paid for by an increase in the local income tax. But after the initial vote was delayed and the council faced public backlash over the proposal, it's unclear if the project will move forward. Now officials are considering conducting a needs assessment to look at other options besides building a new jail. I don't think it can just be a, an assessment of the jail. It has to be of the entire criminal justice system. The original proposal was drafted by the same firm contracted to build the jail. Now, those against it want more independent research. The Vigo, Vigo County Council is scheduled to meet Tuesday, but the jail proposal is not on the agenda. The fiscal conservative group Americans for Prosperity is spending more than a million dollars on an advertising campaign to target Senator Joe Donnelly on tax reform. The ad started running today. They emphasize the need for tax cuts and urge voters not to, quote, let Donnelly stand in the way of a fair tax system. In a video response, Donnelly says the details of tax reform are key, and he hasn't seen anything concrete from President Trump. And like most Hoosiers, I'm not going to buy a car before kicking the tires. That's not standing in the way. That's just common sense. Trump targeted Donnelly when he unveiled his tax reform plan last month in Indianapolis. Indiana's Supreme Court will decide whether the state violated rulemaking procedures when it decided to use a new three-drug cocktail for the lethal injection. It's a combination that's never been used in the country. A death row inmate sued to top the, stop the state from using the drugs. A court of appeals decision earlier this year halted the state's use of the lethal injection drugs, and now the Supreme Court will decide whether to uphold that ruling. At issue is the state's decision back in 2014 to switch to a new lethal injection drug due to a global shortage of the drug traditionally used in death penalty procedures. The attorney for death row inmate Roy Ward argues the state violated rulemaking procedures by choosing the new drugs without public input required by state law. If uh, the state or a state agency, an unelected agency uh, official adopts a new exe execution protocol, particularly one that's never been used in the history of mankind, they should at least do so in the public, in front of the public. But the state's attorney argues the DOC is excluded from those rulemaking procedures when choosing a new drug because it's an internal policy change. It doesn't grant any rights. It doesn't grant any obligations it, um, to the offender. Instead, it instructs its staff on what it will do in carrying out the execution. There's no timeline for the Supreme Court to issue its decision. The state hasn't executed a death row inmate since 2009. Now, because Indiana's injection drugs were nearing expiration, lawmakers put language in the budget bill that authorizes the state to purchase new lethal injection drugs without revealing the identity of the manufacturer or supplier. Now, the measure wasn't debated and was released on the last day of the session. 
Just shy of 30% of the state's schools received an A grade based on results from last spring's I-STEP. That's up about six percentage points from the previous school year. The number of schools with B ratings fell about the same amount, while there was little change among lower ratings. About 6% of schools received F grades. This year's ratings are much more stable than a year ago, when the number of schools receiving A's plummeted after an overhaul of the I-STEP exam. State education officials warn another major shakeup will come when the state switches to a new test in 2019. State education officials plan to pay a company $43 million to create, implement, and grade the new test that will replace the I-STEP. State officials approved a three-year contract with the Washington, D.C.-based American Institutes for Research. They chose it over four other companies, even though it wasn't the cheapest. A committee that's studying whether to eliminate Indiana's license requirement to carry a handgun is scheduled to meet for the last time next week. The proposed move is part of a nationwide shift known as constitutional carry. The committee is charged with considering the issue as it relates to revenue, suicide and crime. The potential conflicts of interest for local officials who approve large wind energy projects took center stage this week at the State House. County commissions and planning boards approve wind farm developments in Indiana. Republican Representative Dave Ober says in some cases, those commissioners have also signed lease agreements with developers and would benefit from a project's approval. Uh, I see a very large issue with that, and I hope that uh, we can work on that issue next year. The committee heard from dozens of Hoosiers about how wind farms affect or don't affect property values, health, and county budgets. The committee will hold one more meeting before issuing a report to the General Assembly. Bloomington City Council members are supporting a plan that would allow Cook to make annual payments to the city in exchange for Bloomington agreeing not to annex any Cook properties that sit outside of city limits. Under the proposed agreement, Cook would pay the city a minimum of $100,000 a year for the next 15 years. Cook played a role in halting the city's annexation plans by pressuring lawmakers to take legislative action earlier this year. A former Vigo County Sheriff's deputy will spend another five months in jail after he pleaded guilty to charges of wire fraud and theft of government funds. A judge sentenced Frank Shahady this week to 16 months behind bars. He's already spent 11 months in custody. Shahady was part of a kickback scheme that cost the Vigo County School District more than $80,000. Shahady has to pay slightly more in restitution, but that will be cut in half if co-defendant Frank Fennell is convicted. Fennell's trial is set for December. An Indiana judge has thrown out a lawsuit filed by former subway pitchman Jared Fogel's ex-wife. The suit accused Subway of continuing to promote Fogel, even though it knew of his sexual interest in children. A Boone County judge dismissed the case, arguing that each of the subway entities Fogel's wife had sued were outside of Indiana and not under the judge's jurisdiction. Fogel is serving a 15-year sentence for child pornography and sex crimes. Lawrence County's needle exchange is closed until the county commission can meet and vote whether to reopen it. The Indiana Recovery Alliance operates the exchange. Program director Chris Abert says he wants the commissioners to look at the data behind the syringe programs. He says the exchange has saved 52 lives in Lawrence County since it started late last year. If we're not reapproved, is uh, is the death and and an infection with deadly disease of a whole generation of Lawrence County residents. IRA officials say the suspension is the result of the county dealing with a confusing change in state law. The needle exchange is on the commission's October 17th agenda. The state is launching a campaign aimed at reducing the stigma surrounding addiction. Advocates say for people suffering from addiction, stigma can be a barrier to treatment. And maybe you don't feel particularly comfortable in that office because you're getting some looks. And maybe even the language that is used by the intake nurse around being an addict. Uh, it makes you never really want to go back there. 
The campaign teaches that addiction is a disease, not a character flaw, and that recovery is possible. Officials plan to halt 16,000 drivers from renewing their vehicle registrations for repeatedly failing to pay Ohio Bridge River tolls. Tolls began December 30th on three bridges connecting Louisville, Kentucky and southern Indiana. Kentucky and Indiana could withhold vehicle registrations for unpaid bridge tolls under laws passed in both states. Drivers who are targeted have ignored four invoices. Columbus City leaders are trying to help clean up neighborhoods by towing away abandoned vehicles free of charge. The city of Columbus will take that vehicle out to the salvage yard and the owner can get the money, you know, that uh, the salvage company would pay for that. Linup says it helps car owners who don't have a lot of money and gets rid of an eyesore on city streets. The Spencer Pride LGBTQ Center is buying a new building that will allow it to increase its footprint by nearly 10 times. The center moved into a new building on the Owen County Courthouse Square just last year, but it's already outgrown the space. The new building is just a couple blocks away. There's no timeline for when the center will move. It depends on several factors, including funding. A U.S. House committee has advanced a plan to make Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore the state's first national park. Indiana's congressional delegation is behind the legislation. They hope the designation will boost the region's tourism industry. Some Dunes officials say they're cautiously optimistic. They like the idea of more visitors, but worry about the environmental challenges more traffic might cause. And Joe, the full House will next vote on whether to send this to the Senate. All right. Thank you very much, Barbara. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. An increasing number of seniors are left in a situation where they can't even afford to eat. Ahead, the tangle of issues contributing to the problem. The Las Vegas shooting could lead to changes in gun laws. Ahead, a legal expert joins us to explain what's being considered and how significant it really is. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Ten thousand. Fifteen? Fifteen, you think? Twenty. Twenty-one thousand? Six hundred. Twenty. Eighteen five. Twenty-four. It's at least forty. Look, yeah, look at 4, it. Forty-five hundred thousand. Six fifty. Twenty. Six fifty. This textile would be worth about a half a million dollars. Half a million? No way! I knew it. It's just a blanket. It's laying on the back of a chair. Well, sir, you have a national treasure. Wow. A national treasure. Congratulations. I can't believe this. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. The mass shooting that left nearly 60 people dead in Las Vegas is reviving the country's gun debate. In Indiana, some people are urging Congress to consider all options to promote public safety. There are things we can do. There are things we must do. But it needs to start out with saying, let's try to fix this problem. Let's try to deal with it. Let's get all the options on the table. President Trump visited Las Vegas this week. When asked to comment on gun violence, he said he would not discuss the issue. Jody Madeira is a professor of law at Indiana University, and she joins me to discuss some of the gun laws. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. So what are some of the possibilities, kind of giving more of a, a legal standpoint, of mm -hmm. seeing really any real movement of gun reform in the future? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's an excellent question because we get a lot of the political side of things. But from the legal side, I think we have quite a bit of wiggle room. I mean, short of banning handguns, there are a number of options that states and the federal government could take, right? Uh, they just haven't for quite a while. But I think one of the most likely measures is actually going to be re to restrict or to ban so-called bump stocks. So we've been hearing that term more now. Uh, what's the definition of a bump stock? 
Excellent question. Yeah. Well, I think a bump stock is a, it replaces the regular stock of a rifle and you place it against your shoulder. And what it does is when the rifle fires naturally, there's a kickback and the bump stock harnesses the natural recoil of the rifle uh, if you keep your finger pressed onto the trigger so that basically there's just a uh, capability to file, fire as many as 900 rounds per minute. So in effect, it's a fixture that takes and makes a, a semi-automatic semi -automatic weapon an automatic weapon. You know, we also heard the term assault weapons mm -hmm. too. Is that an assault weapon or are they different? I think they are different. So usually, and there isn't really such a thing as an assault weapon. Uh -huh. Really, there's assault style rifles. Um, I think assault weapon is usually a term that has great political and cultural cachet. It makes a lot of people angry. It has a lot of emotion behind it. But really, there's no such thing as an assault weapon. Uh, rather, an assault weapon, technically defined, is a fully automatic weapon. Um, the assault weapons ban that was placed into operation in 1994 did take some physical features, such as a collapsible stock, and define those weapons as assault style weapons. And just really quick 10 seconds, what are mm -hmm. the chances that any any reform will happen? I think the bump stock actually reform will, will has a pretty good likelihood of passing. Uh, whether it will actually result in meaningful change, however, I don't know. I've also read uh, media reports that say that gun owners are really trying to buy them up as fast as possible. Thank you very much for being here, appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it's been almost a decade since the Great Recession devastated people around the globe. Most people have found a way to recover, but one group is still disproportionately struggling. As Tyler Lake reports, seniors who saw their savings disappear haven't been able to bounce back. Gordon Lambden has worked as a mechanic his whole life. He and his father started a garage in 1960, and Gordon worked on cars there until he fell and broke his hip just last year. And that was a bad one. I mean, uh, well, I... Uh, I quit breathing three or four times. Now he has trouble getting around and can no longer drive. He lives frugally and has to eat a lot of prepared meals. If it wasn't for a can opener and a microwave, I'd starve to death. He uses a patchwork of resources to get through each month. His children help him when they can. He qualifies to receive some food assistance. Jordan. And he gets hot meals twice a week from the Mercy Shelter. How are you today? Yeah. All right. People who need help can come here and pick up food but they also deliver meals, about 400 a month to Orange County residents. Many of the people receiving food deliveries are the elderly who have neither the money nor access to transportation to get food themselves. Research shows when people don't have access to transportation, they're about twice as likely to suffer from food insecurity. I, I would say probably 85% of the people that we deliver to really need to have a meal delivered to them. While the number of Americans facing food insecurity has been on the rise over the past 15 years, the elderly have fared far worse than the rest of the population since the 2008 recession. According to Feeding America, 3 million elderly Americans can be labeled as food insecure. Those numbers are up by around a half million since the economic downturn. And it's not an issue that's unique to rural areas. Chrissy Peterson has been helping elderly who are in need in Indianapolis for more than a decade. She says there is no one culprit, rather a series of challenges seniors face. Doctor visits are more often and are more expensive. Um, food costs are just now slowly starting to go down. Um, food stamps haven't increased. The cost of living have it, has it increased. Transportation is also a huge part of the problem. When you don't have transportation and you don't have money for bus passes, you go to the, go the gas stations, you go to the non-traditional places, so most of the stuff that they're eating isn't healthy. But it isn't just an issue of the quality of food. According to Feeding America, seniors who face food insecurity are also at increased risk for many ailments, including a 53% increase for heart failure. Amy O'Brien does nutrition outreach for seniors in Bloomington. She says that the combination of being low income, having low mobility, and little access to transportation leaves many seniors in a dangerous place, and not just physically. There's also, um, I think, a, a generational or a family structure issue. People are so isolated um, that a lot of our clients don't have family or friends that are, are kind of picking up that slack that maybe historically somebody else would have. It all takes its toll, as Gordon Lambden can attest. He's frustrated that he has to rely on charity to survive, and he misses the days when he felt like he was independent and in control. 
it kind of works on you because, uh, you know, you kind of feel ashamed and this, that, and the other because uh, you can't keep up the, with the things that you used to. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you know the end's coming, but when you don't know, and uh, there's things you'd like to experience and things you'd like to eat and this, that, and the other that you don't do anymore or can't do anymore. And, For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. And that's a struggle more and more seniors will face in the future. As baby boomers age and live longer, they outgrow their retirement. Feeding America anticipates seniors facing hunger will increase by 50% within the next decade. The best historic hotel in the country is right in our backyard. The West Baden Springs Hotel received top honors from the Worldwide Historic Hotels Trade Association. There were more than 200 nominees. The West Baden Hotel dates back to the early 1900s. In 2007, a massive renovation project to return the hotel to its original grandeur was complete. Its famous dome has been dubbed the eighth wonder of the world. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. IU Health Southern Indiana Physicians, Primary Care and Specialty Care Providers, now accepting new patients in Bloomington and throughout South Central Indiana, siphysicians.org. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching and learning in Indiana and around the world. More at education. Dot indiana dot edu. Smithville Fiber, the Giga City Company, Fiber Internet, HD, and Digital IPTV in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. And by WTIU members. Thank you.